progress. What is also a work in progress is the debate, of course, over the voice. Now, this is having an Indigenous voice to Parliament. The, most of the focus is on the national voice, and for good reason, because um, that involves the whole country, every single one of us, at the same time. And it also involves quite a profound thing, and that is to change the Constitution, because we don't change the Constitution that often. Um, so, so that's why that's getting most of the attention. In the meantime, of course, you'd be aware if you're a regular listener to ABC Radio Adelaide um, that the state government has its own voice to Parliament. And that's able to be achieved without a referendum because you've got a funny old constitution. You can change our constitution just through a vote of Parliament. The people don't need to be consulted. So that's what's being done at a South Australian level. And... Uh, the, the government is actually quite proud of this because they're saying, look, we'll be able to get on and do this quickly and we'll be able to show the rest of the nation how this can work and that there's nothing to fear here. We've been working on it for quite a while. We reckon this will work and, and we'll just get on with it and, and that'll take a lot of the steam out of, out of this debate. So they think this is, um, this is actually going to be a very positive thing. Got somebody in the studio who disagrees. Sarah Game is One Nation MP in State Parliament's Upper House, and she joins us now. Good morning, Sarah Game. Good morning. Are you a racist? Uh, no, but I, I think that um, we've touched on the essence of why we're not hearing much of the no uh, debate in Parliament, because people are afraid that... If they don't support this government's approach to enhancing the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, then they must in some way not want to enhance the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So what do you say is wrong with establishing a voice to the South Australian Parliament? Well, there's so much wrong. I mean, first of all, the name of the legislation is wrong because uh, the name The Voice absolutely plays on the compassion of the Australian people because it makes you feel as though, I mean, everyone wants a voice uh, for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Everyone in South Australia should have a voice. They should have the same voice. And so firstly, by naming a piece of legislation The Voice, I think simply uh, people will feel, OK, yes, we do want them to have a voice, but th that's not what this legislation is about. This legislation is about, firstly, a race divide and a focus on race, uh, which is my main uh, objection. And also it's about uh, an extraordinary or the, definitely the potential for an extraordinary amount of cost to the South Australian taxpayer. So, well, well there's two things there. One Correct. is the, the, the cost. You say that that is the practical um implications of this. Yeah. You, you, you've looked at the legislation and you think this is just going to get away from the government and, and, the, and the parliament and it's, it's just going to consume an, an, an enormous amount of uh, money. Um, that, that's fair? Yeah. That is fair. And can I just say, David, because I listened to the Premier talking to you uh, the other week about The Voice and I thought how disappointing it really was to hear uh, him say, oh, look, you know, it can't do any harm. Uh, you know, it can't do any harm. And I really couldn't uh, believe that because surely if we're going to spend all of this time and energy establishing such uh, something so significant, um, you know, we need to be confident um, that actually this is going to work. Okay, but, but before you get to what you say are the practical implications, you say there's something more fundamental and that is you think that this is racist. C can I put to you something that Chris Kenny wrote in, in The Weekend Australian. And I think this is really interesting because um, Chris is somebody that the left love to hate. Uh, but I, I think of all the people who've argued for the, the voice, the national voice, he, his, is, he, his are some of the most persuasive arguments. He thinks the voice is going to work and it's a positive, things, uh, it's a positive thing. And while he's talking about the national voice, I think the same arguments could apply to the, the state-based one. He writes this in The Weekend Oz. It is also wrong to claim this is a racial or racist measure. 
It proposes a representative body for Indigenous people not based on racial characteristics, but on the simple reality that they are the descendants of the original inhabitants. Nor does it confer special privilege. It allocates only an opportunity to offer advice on matters affecting Indigenous people. What do you say to that? Well, I say that we absolutely should be living, listening to Indigenous people. I mean, we should already be listening to everybody. I, I disagree, actually, completely, because to be involved with the voice, to be elected and to vote, one must be Aboriginal and therefore, uh, or, or Torres Strait Islander. And therefore, it absolutely focuses us back on race to say, well, are you in fact Aboriginal? And even uh, the South Australian uh, Commissioner for The Voice is aware of that focus because when you look at his engagement report, it suggests we may indeed end up with a special Aboriginal Commissioner to in fact establish Aboriginality. And I think in a day in which we're... Um, into marrying more and more, you know, some people, uh, you know, may have one eighth, uh, 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 you know, a connection. Then um, you can't always easily identify who's Aboriginal, and I think this is a really backward step that we need to sort of look at people and think, well, are you in fact Aboriginal? I mean, the legislation says you are if you are in fact biologically descended, but then um, there's no way really of establishing that, and I, and I don't think that focus is a healthy or, or a good thing at all. And it's completely different from respecting people's right to culture and maintain culture, which I absolutely do. But I think the way forward is to look at people based on need. Um, and that would capture those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are in despairing conditions without this race focus. But it, it is an established fact that there are Aboriginal people and they are disadvantaged. We, we know that. We know there is a huge gap on, on any number of criteria between those people and the rest of, of the country. So if you can identify a group of people, doesn't it make sense to set up a mechanism by which that group of people can then give advice on how they should be treated? Well, I think firstly I want to point out that lots of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are doing really well. You know, they are absolutely thriving and contributing and they're finishing school and they're going to university uh, and they're gaining employment and they are doing well. That's not to negate the fact that there's still a disproportionate number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are in despairing conditions, but I would say that vast majority of people, the statistics I've looked at, three quarters of people who are in fact in poverty or homeless or at risk of being homeless are in fact not Indigenous. And so uh, I would argue that absolutely we need to listen to people in need, but I don't feel that it should be race-based. Uh, it should be need needs-based. Is that, is that because even if you could argue that right now you could the, the present circumstances justify setting up a body to address the gap with a, a platform for Aboriginal people to, to, to speak once you've set it up once the gap has been closed and let's hope it's closed soon but even mm. if it was closed in 50 years or 100 years however long it takes you'd still be left with the mechanism. So are you arguing, and is that what you believe is wrong with having a mechanism that is actually based around an identifiable community, whether you want to use the word race or not? Is, 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 does that show what you say is the problem here? I think that's partly the problem in that I think it will be very difficult to ever remove uh, what's being established. But I think uh, it really leads on to the second point uh, that I made, which is I don't think that we should be having to pay and establish this voice as a simple result of the government, in fact, already not listening. I mean, I um, have had limited opportunities so far, but certainly have had uh, opportunity, which I've greatly enjoyed, to interact uh, with various members of the Aboriginal community. And everyone I've interacted with, they've already spoken to the current government. They've made them aware of what's going on in their community. Um, and there is the opportunity already for that for our government to be listening. Right. 
Right. Um, Kai Ma is, is with us now, and he's your colleague in the Upper House. He's the South Australian Attorney General. He's an, an, an Indigenous man, and he joins us now. Good morning, Kai Ma. Good morning, David. What would you like to say to Sarah Game? Oh, look, uh, it's more to the South Australian community in general, David, that I'd like to say I, I don't think there's anything to fear from either a state or a federal voice. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of conversations with people and, and with, with people, and I know my colleagues have as well, who um, don't understand yet what's being proposed, particularly in a federal context, but almost always when the time spent talking about what is being proposed, that it, yeah, it's not a body that... Yeah, makes binding decisions as an advisory body. It's not a body that has a function to be able to you know, decide how government money's spent. It's an advisory body. Almost universally, with the, the time to sit down and explain what it is that's being proposed, uh, people who are not sure about it are supportive of the voice. And you know, I think uh, yeah, the opinion polls, I think, demonstrate, and I think the vast majority of Australians, and, and indeed probably even at a greater rate, South Australians, support a mechanism where uh, Aboriginal people's voices are heard on issues that concern, are of interest or affect them. Um, I, I think we can, everyone agrees that the disproportionate levels of difference of advantage Aboriginal people face is a, is a stain on us as a society. Sarah Gaim, w- w- what's wrong with that? Well, exactly, and I think that highlights the point there because I think we are all in agreement about listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and giving them a voice. I think it's really about debating whether in order to do that we need to establish uh, this uh, approach of having, I, I understand there to be you know, a minimum of 40 elected members for the local state First uh, Nations voice, um, of local First Nations voice, and then a, there'll be a state First Nations voice, and that state First Nations voice will have the opportunity to establish really um, an endless number of committees, which will all be um, you know, manned by um, uh, members in additional to that 40. And in fact, the legislation doesn't even stipulate that it's 40, so it could be more. So I guess really for me, uh, the debate is about whether all of that is needed uh, to in fact just listen now and, and put our money and resources into tangible benefits now. Kai Ma, do you think Sarah Game is racist? Uh, look, no, I, yeah, on, on what she says about the voice, it's her view. It's, it's not a view that is racist. I think yeah, her, her national party, some of the views that have been expressed over the years, I have grave concerns with. But um, yeah, reasonable people can disagree, David. And, yes. uh, but yeah, well, well, I, I, I yeah, but, but just, just be quite clear on that. Do, do, you think, do you think Sarah Game is a racist? Well, I don't have any evidence to support a conclusion like that, David. No. I think okay. Sarah considers these things and, and puts her views forward. Right. So... If you don't have any evidence that she's a racist, then the arguments that she's putting against the voice, you don't think that's evidence of racism. You just think she's got a different point of view. Yeah, I, I think I think it's I, yeah, it's misguided. I, yeah, certainly from my having worked in and out of Aboriginal affairs for more than twenty years now, it's my very very strong view that you know, what we've been doing in the past in decades and centuries gone by hasn't worked, and that uh, and that you know, hearing directly. The views of Aboriginal people at the highest levels about the decisions that affect their lives, I firmly believe, will make a difference. But yeah, even if I'm wrong on that, even if I'm wrong, yeah, the worst thing that can happen with what we're proposing is Aboriginal people will get a say. That's it. Which, if you boil that argument down, that's really what's the harm in this? Well, yeah, as I say, that's yeah, the worst thing that can happen as a result of this is that uh, yeah, is that Parliament. And government, including ministers, will hear more often and more directly from Aboriginal people about issues that affect their lives. That's the worst thing that can happen. Okay, Sarah Gaim, basically, what's the harm? Well, the harm is uh, that we're going to spend a lot of time, money and resources on paying certain individuals uh, to represent uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community when we could be listening now um, and putting our time and effort into real tangible benefits. I mean, I suggested to the Labor government that they resource, for example, the uh, young person's visitor role who checks on children in residential care, of which we have a disproportionate number of Aboriginal children. That piece of legislation, uh, I was 
was motivated to do that uh, on hearing of the death of an Aboriginal child at the age of 13 in state care. And I wanted proper resourcing uh, for the visitor to go and check on uh, children's welfare. Um, and the Labor government uh, opposed that legislation. So for me, we already know uh, about the high suicide rates. We know about uh, the despairing conditions of the children and families in these situations, and we could be acting on it now. And the harm is, instead of putting our time, effort and resources now into those tangible benefits, we're in fact um, establishing a whole new layer of bureaucracy. So, Sarah, again, before we move, and Kaimar, thank you very much for your time this morning, South Australian Attorney General, and we'll have... Uh, the Attorney General in the studio, I hope next week for him to uh, really have the opportunity that we've given Sarah this morning, you know, you know, sort of flip it so that he'll be able to come in and, and argue his case in the studio. Um, he was, uh, he's travelling to the York Peninsula this morning, so we appreciate his time. We'll get Kai Mar in the studio next week. Thank you for your time. Bef before we move on to a couple of other topics I wanted to raise with you before you leave us, is there anything... Is there anything Kai Ma could do that would bring you around on the voice? Or are your concerns just so fundamental that there's nothing he can do to improve this? Uh, well, no, I think that, that now that I've looked into it, I certainly approached this with an open mind. I think I was the first member of parliament to go and uh, speak with Kaim about The Voice and also the, um, you know, Dale, the South Australian Commissioner for The Voice, and I really wanted to understand it. So, uh, but now I've, I'm really confident that uh, the way forward really is, is needs-based support, not race-based support. And for me, uh, that certainly encapsulates uh, those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that are being left behind. I wonder if you'll be the only MP who opposes this, because um, the Greens will be on side. Um, Labor will vote as a bloc. Um, I don't know, maybe the Liberals uh, will, will, some of them might oppose it. But that's unclear, isn't it? You, you could end up being a lone voice, Sarah Dan. I certainly feel a lone voice in Parliament, but I'm certainly not a lone voice in the community, and I think uh, that, that's evident everywhere I go. I would say the majority of faith uh, groups and organisations that I've spoken to are uh, are against this for the fundamental reason that they don't like the idea of separating us by race and that we should all be uh, the same uh, under the law. And certainly everywhere I go, uh, rural and regional areas in the city, people come and talk to me and they tell me that they're not happy with it. But I think it's, it's just clear that it's one of those topics that people feel they can't voice their view. And that's for the reason that I stated at the beginning, because if you don't support this government's approach mm. to bridging the gap, then that's seen as, as the same as, in fact, accepting the current situation, uh, which, isn't, which isn't the case at all. Mm. Yeah. Uh, oh, Nonna wants to have a say uh, on this. Hello, Nonna. Good morning. What, what we're doing now isn't working. So why not give it a try, the voice? Why not give it a try? Sarah Gunn? Well, I think I've sort of made that. I think what we need to give a try uh, to is actually uh, investing in... Uh, uh, early childhood, making sure children are safe no matter what race they are, that we're keeping families together no, what a, no matter what race they are, that we're helping families with substance abuse uh, problems, that we're helping children go to school. We know that there's an attendance problem already with uh, particularly our Aboriginal children not going to school. If you don't go to school and get an education, you can't get employment, you won't close the gap. And I think we just need to be getting on with it and putting our time, energy and resources uh, into tangible benefits that we already know about. Uh, Nonna, thank you for your call. And as I say, we'll we'll flip this. Next week we'll get Kai Ma in the studio and we're not driving around the York Peninsula. He'll be in the studio and and we'll we'll take it from uh, we'll look at it from that perspective. Um